Hello, and welcome to Western Civ, episode 261, Discovering Earth. Last week, we started the scientific revolution by focusing on the concept of discovery. Discovery, to a large extent, made the scientific revolution possible. Today, I want to go a step further and consider more deeply how the age of discovery and early scientific revolution contributed to Europeans' changing understanding of the very world around them. It turns out what they had believed for centuries was false. But how then to go about adjusting a perception which had existed since almost the time of Christ? Today, it is that question to which we devote this episode. The voyages of discovery completely changed European perceptions about the world from roughly 1460 onwards. Consider this. What was known of the world in 1450 was roughly what was known of the world in the year one common era. So this is a big change we're talking about. Conventional attitudes that the lands around the equator were uninhabitable because the seas boiled and men would literally melt turned out to be nonsense. There were whole continents unknown to the Greeks and Romans. These new lands were carefully mapped by cartographers in what was likely the first great victory of experience or philosophy in the history of the West. The invention of what we call the Terraqueous Globe took place over the course of a few years. This isn't actually a globe, by the way. It's a map. But it's a map that works like a globe, with lines of latitude and longitude. And crucially, it puts into scale for the first time all the different new and unexplored regions of the Earth. This, of course, brings us to a very crucial question. What shape is the Earth? The answer to this question must seem obvious. Surely everyone knew that the Earth is round. In the 19th century, it was claimed that Columbus's contemporaries thought the world was flat and expected him to sail over the edge. That story is ridiculous. But the fact that everyone, or at least every properly educated person, thought that you could in principle sail around the world, and in 1519 Magellan and his crew did just that, that doesn't mean that they thought the world was round. Columbus, strangely, thought that the old world, known to Ptolemy, was half of a perfect sphere. But the new world, he believed, was shaped like the top half of a pear, or, as he says, a breast. And he had the impression that he was sailing uphill as the Azores receded behind him. The stalk or nipple of this other hemisphere was the location of terrestrial paradise. The Earth or rather the earth and water, simply bulged. So, along with this difficulty of what shape is the earth, the other problem for Europeans, when it came to translating how this new world functioned, was the relationship between earth and water. By earth, I mean land. Generally, most of the philosophy on the subject agreed that land and water occupied distinct spheres on the globe in some way. Whether you think about, you know, a giant ocean that surrounds all the land, or perhaps the opposite, the idea was that each zone was distinct and continuous, i.e. what I mean by that is you couldn't have ocean and then more land. Land was continuous, ocean was continuous, they were two separate spheres. The idea that there are not separate spheres, that this is wrong, doesn't start to come into being until the very earliest, the 13th century. And even then, the idea doesn't gain any traction until the 14th. The reason that this theory is so important is that it's the only theory that squares ultimately with reality. Namely, that land masses are scattered throughout the Earth. In fact, the theory that emerges in the 14th century 
asserts that land masses should be scattered throughout the globe. This is the only theory that fits with the now obvious existence of antipodes, bodies of land directly opposite to each other on the globe. Now, sadly, again, this theory had almost no support prior to 1492. For us to see how this begins to break apart, we have to first begin to think about astronomy, which was, to be blunt, probably the only science we would recognize as science in the late medieval early Renaissance period. Students in this period learned their astronomy by studying the sphere, published in 1220, Common Era, by Johannes de Sacrobosco. His textbook was widely printed in 1472, once the printing press took hold, and actually went through more than 200 editions. The sphere was still the standard astronomy textbook when Galileo taught at the University of Padua in the late 16th century. In line with the notion that the globe was made up of two non-concentric spheres, one of earth and one of water, following the example of Ptolemy's Almagest, which had been available in the Latin West from about the 12th century onward, Sacrobosco proved separately that the surface of the earth was curved. He showed how this could be made apparent to someone traveling either north, south, or east, west, and that the surface of water was curved. This was evident because a lookout on the top of a ship's mast could see farther than someone standing on the deck, which wouldn't be the case if the earth was flat. Modern commentators assume that Saprobosco had proved the earth is round. He had done nothing of the sort, and medieval commentators didn't claim that he had, for neither he nor they believed that the two spheres shared a common center. Hence, when medieval philosophers talk about the earth, they meant the land, namely the sphere of dry land that showed above the ocean. All these late medieval discussions took place within a context of a geographical knowledge which corresponded to that of the ancients. No one believed that the earth was flat, but the habitable earth could be represented fairly accurately on a flat surface. The habitable earth had a center, which was generally taken to be Jerusalem. However, there was another center, measuring from west to east, from the Fortunate Isles, which are the Canaries, to the Pillars of Hercules, which marked the limit beyond which it was impossible to travel, there existed a notional location on the equator that was called Arim, or Aran, believed to be about 10 degrees east of Baghdad. For the Arabs, and for astronomers relying on Arabic sources, Arim represented the degree zero of longitude and latitude. It was universally accepted that dry land was confined to one hemisphere, the rest being covered by ocean. Of the dry land, The furthest northern and southern parts were uninhabitable because they were either too cold or too hot, as the habitable portion of Earth represented approximately one-half of the whole of the dry land, one-sixth of the whole agglomeration of Earth and water. Thus, this two-sphere theory of the world was shared by nearly all philosophers, astronomers, and cartographers, despite the difficulties it was known to present, until the late 15th century when the rediscovery of Ptolemy's geography was incorporated into it without much difficulty. The Portuguese explorers reached the equator in 1474 or 1475, discovering a new heavens and a new stars when things suddenly reversed. But they didn't find any uninhabitable zones, and this required some minor rethinking, but little more. It's true that Ptolemy in geography, unlike the Almagest, treated Earth and water as a single sphere, and this was obviously bound to be of interest. After the translation of Ptolemy's geography, there's no record of a terrestrial globe being made in 1453. Columbus read Ptolemy and was convinced that the Earth and the water formed one sphere. He produced a small globe to illustrate his planned voyage. At the same time, he chose to reject Ptolemy's account of the extent of the habitable world, preferring a different man, that of the name of Marinus of Tyre, who claimed that the habitable portion of the earth extended more than halfway around the globe, 
a view difficult to reconcile with the two spheres theory. And of course, the crisis then begins with Columbus's landfall in 1492. In 1493, Peter Martyr described Columbus as returning from the, quote, Western Antipodes, end quote. In a notorial certificate drawn up by another man, Pedro Alvarez Cabral's discovery of Brazil in 1500 is described as the discovery of the, quote, land of Antipodes, end quote. He was right, by the way. Brazil is antipodal to the eastern extremity of the world known to the ancients. But the decisive event was the publication in 1503 of the first letter written, or supposedly written, by Amerigo Vespucci, entitled Mundus Novus, which went through 29 editions in the space of four years. It was Vespucci's second letter, by the way, which introduced the word discovery to European audiences. Vespucci's claim was that he had encountered a vast new landmass, which formed no part of the previously known world. He had found, in other words, a new world. Moreover, it was clear that this landmass, although it was only one quarter of the way around the globe from his starting point, was halfway around the globe from other parts of the known world. And Vespucci sailed 50 degrees south of the equator. This was not just the equatorial antipodes that some exponents of the two spheres theory had envisaged. Antipodes had become a reality, and there was no way anymore that you could fit Earth's landmass into one hemisphere. So up to this moment, it was possible to assert that the spheres of ocean and Earth were round, and that the zone of dry land, as the Bible asserted, had four corners. You could just change the idea that these were four square corners into rounded ones, and the idea still worked fine. But as I mentioned, the problem was this concept of a one-hemisphere, multi-sphere Earth and how it's just bedeviling to people trying to make globes. In 1507, two globe makers tried to sidestep the issue by naming their project Omen Terrae Ambitum, or the whole circumference of the Earth, and claimed of this, Ptolemy only knew one quarter. And again, we find why language is critical to understanding the shift in perception taking place here. In classical Latin, the word orb was derived from orbis, meaning not just a sphere, but also potentially a flat disk. When Cicero wrote of the orbis, he means habitable dry land. The concept of a globe, and the modern concept of a globe, is totally foreign to this. Finally, in 1518, George Tansetter published the first ever edition of the sphere that shows a modern conception of the globe, one with interlocking land and sea. But that was 26 years after Columbus reached the Americas. From 1538 onward, the idea that the earth and water made up one sphere became the dominant theory. And that's an amazing change. The two-sphere theory was unquestioned in 1475. By 1550, it was totally abandoned. Once more, This was the triumph of experience and evidence over theory and logical argument. The invention of the printing press and the invention of discovery acting in combination transformed the balance between evidence and theory, tilting it away from the reinterpretation of old arguments and toward the acquisition and interpretation of new evidence. As far as the two-sphere theory was concerned, the voyages of Vespucci were deadly. The new facts were killer facts. As it happened, this is the first occasion since the establishment of universities in the 13th century on which a political theory was destroyed by a fact. Astonishingly, as it might seem, there is no previous occasion on which new empirical evidence determined the outcome of a long-standing debate between philosophers. Aristotle, for example, had argued that the nerves are all connected to the heart. Galen had shown that they were connected to the brain. But Aristotelian philosophers, both ancient and medieval, had continued following Aristotle's teaching, as if Galen didn't exist. In 1507, 
the relationship between theory and evidence changed, and it changed forever. We're going to get more into Nikolai Copernicus in a few weeks. But for now, know that the broad outline of Copernicus's argument for the Earth as a single globe was conventional by 1543. That was when it was published. We know that he formulated this view as early as 1514. Again, I will get more into his theories in much greater detail here in a bit. What is interesting for us now, from a macro level, is how Copernicus's theories about the world were received. Note, he died shortly after their publication, so is not around for debate. It used to be taught in many schools that Copernicus sparked an intellectual revolution. Sadly, that's just false. Sure, astronomers were interested in what he had to say, but most assumed his arguments for a moving Earth were plain wrong. If the Earth moved, the argument went, we would be aware of it. You would feel the wind in your face, like if you ride in an open car or on a bicycle. If you dropped an object from a tower, it would fall to the west, etc., etc. Other men would solve this riddle, i.e. that the earth does move, but much too slowly to impact us in perceptible ways. But for now, we need to accept the reality that Copernicus's work was maybe less revolutionary than it's often made out to be. For example, while there is no mention of astrology in his work, Copernicus never disputed the standard view of the time that astronomy existed to make astrology possible. That was its purpose. Copernicus's view of the universe is different from Ptolemy's, in that the sun, not the earth, lies at the center. But, in all other respects, Copernicus's view is identical to Ptolemy's. It was a series of spheres, one nested within the next. All movement within it was heavenly and perfect, and therefore circular. For the first two generations of astronomers reading Copernicus, the crucial point about his book was not that it advocated heliocentrism, but that it took the principle of circular movement more seriously. Finally, Copernicus's universe, like Ptolemy's, was finite in size. What then are the implications of claiming that the Earth is a planet? Copernicus does not discuss the question, but his successors would have to. In the summer of 1538, an Italian man by the name of Giordano Bruno gave a series of lectures in Italian in Oxford in 1538. By then it had been 40 years since Copernicus had published On the Revolutions. His new astronomy had certain evident advantages over the established astronomy of Ptolemy. According to Plato and Aristotle, all movement in the heavens should be circular and unchanging. And in the Renaissance, there were still philosophers trying to construct a simple model of the universe, which consisted of spheres nested around a common center. But try as they might, these philosophers could not get such models to fit what actually happens in the heavens. What Ptolemy had managed to achieve was a system that accurately predicted movements in the heavens. The Ptolemaic system, like those of Plato and Aristotle, claimed that the moon, the sun, and all the planets circled around the earth. But in order to accurately predict the movement of these heavenly bodies, and it was a complex system of what were called deference, circles, epicycles, circles on circles, and eccentrics, circles rotating around a display center, and equants all had to be used. The equant was a device for speeding up and slowing down the movement of a body in the heavens by measuring its movement not from the center of a circle, but from a different point. By this means, the movement could be described as constant. 
essentially what it comes down to was Ptolemy had figured out in a very artful way how to get a round peg to fit in a square hole. You had to just jimmy it a lot. It was awkward. It had a lot of bizarre calculations, but it worked. Now Copernicus comes along and proposes to abolish the equant and to eliminate the epicycle for each planet further from the sun than the earth by showing how the movement of the earth created an apparent movement in the sky equivalent to these epicycles. Copernicus also claimed that his system was preferable because it specified more tightly the characteristics of the system as a whole. Ptolemaic philosophers had never been sure, for example, whether Venus or the sun was closer to the earth. Here, Copernicus's system had a huge advantage because it placed the heavenly bodies in a fixed and permanent order. Still, as late as 1538, there were, as far as historians know, only three competent astronomers in all of Europe who accepted Copernicus's claim that the Earth traveled around the Sun. In Germany, there was Christoph Rothmann. In Italy, Giovanni Bettini. And in England, Thomas Diggs. Several of these men were able to push Copernicanism a little bit further, to argue for an infinite and eternal universe. The stars, they said, were suns, and the sun was a star. And here, actually, they weren't following Copernicus, but Aristarchus of Samos, who lived back in the 4th century BCE. Thus, they argued, there could be other inhabited planets in the universe. Even the sun and the stars might be inhabited, for they could not be equally hot all over, and there might be creatures quite different from ourselves who thrive on the heat. Moreover, there was nothing to show that the other planets were different from the Earth. Several argued that the moon and planets could be presumed to have continents and oceans, and that they shone not by their own light, as generally was assumed, but solely by reflected light. Thus seen from the moon, the Earth would look like a gigantic moon. Soon from even farther away, it would look like a brighter star in the sky. The Earth, one of these men thought, would shine brightly because the seas would reflect more light than the land. Thus, for the first time, we start imagining an infinite universe with numberless stars and planets, all possibly inhabited by extraterrestrial life forms. Interestingly, these men weren't the first to imagine infinite universes with extraterrestrial life. Back in 1440, Nicholas of Cusa, in his On Learned Ignorance, had argued that only an infinite universe was appropriate for a finite god. Nicholas thought the earth was a heavenly body, which from a distance would shine like a star, an idea that would later catch attention. But Nicholas assumed that the earth and the sun were similar bodies. A habitable world, Nicholas thought, was hidden behind the shining visible surface of the sun. As for the earth, it, like the sun, was surrounded by a fiery mantle, which, for some reason, was invisible to us. But really, the first competent astronomer to argue for an infinite universe was Diggs, the English astronomer. In 1507, he was the first person to explicitly propose an infinite universe. Diggs was not an insignificant figure in new astronomy. In 1573, he had published a study of the nova and supernova, which had appeared the previous year. And yet, at the same time, he was happily engaged in using the new astronomy to predict the weather and to decide when doctors should bleed their patients. He published his new Copernican account of the cosmos alongside his father's old Ptolemaic account. He knew that the Copernican system could only work if the cosmos was much bigger than the Ptolemaics had imagined, but he didn't correct some of the figures from before. And there's where I think we get our biggest takeaway from today's episode. The reality is that like most revolutions, the scientific revolution was never uniform in its direction. There was a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of efforts, even by the men who would consider to be 
the best astronomers of their age to still figure out some way to get all these new findings to fit neatly within the Ptolemaic box, or at the very least, to figure out a new way to get the circular peg to fit into the square hole. It's going to take repeated knocks to the system, and really, we're going to have to wait for Galileo to see the system completely be brought to its knees. But that won't be for another 50 or 60 years from where we are right now. And we are going to get to Galileo. It's just going to take me a little bit of time. So it's interesting to think of how the new discoveries from the voyage of Columbus lead to new discoveries by men like Copernicus, which caused the old system to buckle, but not necessarily break, at least not in every case. All right, we're going to pick it up next week with evidence and experimentation. That'll be one of our last sort of broad episodes before we ultimately get into looking more closely at first Copernicus and then Galileo. But in the meantime, if you're looking for some additional content to tide you over, I highly recommend checking out a free seven-day trial of either the Patreon account, link is in the show notes, or Western Civ 2.0. You can get all the episodes, seven-day free trial, just by clicking the link and downloading it into, I believe at this point, any podcast app that you may so choose, and it'll show up there every time I upload a new episode. As always, if you are interested in additional content, you can check out the website, westernsippodcast.com. And if you have enjoyed the show, I always appreciate a rating or review in whatever system you happen to be listening to this right now.